Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 112 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week we've had some new queens to introduce and I've been forced to delay extracting our spring honey harvest. Beekeeping Short and Sweet a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. I'm grateful to Honey Poor Hives for sponsoring in part our podcast for this season. Honey Poor Hives, as I'm sure you're aware, are Polly Langstroth hives, and we're setting up an apiary full of their hives this season, courtesy of Honey Poor. Check out their range of hives and other equipment on their website, and I'll leave links to all of the websites in the show notes as usual. Honey Poor Hives, designed by beekeepers for beekeepers. Welcome back to the podcast. It's been another fast and furious week of beekeeping with more sunny and dry weather. It's been dry for some time now, and we don't have any sight of rain on the forecast horizon for some time to come. On the face of it, you could be forgiven for thinking that's a good thing. Warm, sunny days means the bees can get out and forage from early in the morning. I was at the allotment this morning at 5.45 and the sun was warming up nicely as I did the rounds of the cabbages and beetroot. But I was there to water some of the plants and that's the same problems our wild flowering plants suffer. If it's too dry with no rain at all, the plants don't have the resources to produce large full flowers dripping with nectar and bursting with pollen. Instead, we get smaller flowers with very little nectar and tiny amounts of pollen. So here we are at the end of May, hoping for some rainfall. I'm very lucky, as most of my apiary sites are located near lakes and rivers. Wild brambles cover vast areas of riverbanks and have their roots dipped nicely in the damp ground around them. But once again, it's all about resources. As with most things in the natural world, Plants and animals need resources to grow and develop, and our honeybees are exactly the same. I mentioned at the start of the podcast I have some new queens. These come from a fellow bee farmer here in the UK and are a buckfast style bee. I had been toying with the idea of importing some queens, but my concerns over CBPV, chronic bee paralysis virus, and just the general feeling of I don't really want to do that, meant I was searching around for some UK bred queens. These at the moment are as close as I can get for now. I've become a little unorganised, dare I say it, again this season. My plans have been scuffed a little because of the back problems which have flared up again, meaning I'm being forced to reduce the amount of lifting and bending I can do for a week or two. That in turn has meant a delay to queen rearing and moving hives off the oilseed rape, which has finally tipped past its best and is now a green field of swelling pods rather than a field of yellow flowers. More of that in a while. Um, just going back to the new queens, they were due to arrive on Wednesday morning of this last week, so I had to prepare the ground ahead of that by setting up some nukes for them. My preference for queen introduction is by using nukes. To qualify that a bit further, here I'm talking about mated laying queens, not virgin queens, going into mating nukes. So I had 20 queens arriving and needed to set up a corresponding number of queenless nukes to release these queens into. You don't need a huge number of frames of bees to settle a new queen into her new home, unless of course you're looking to develop a colony fast and get a crop of honey off her in the same season, which is easily doable. But part of my reasoning for getting these queens was to further develop the honey poor poly Langstroth hives and build more colonies a little quicker than would have been possible if I'd made splits and placed queen cells into the nukes. By doing this, and if all goes to plan, I'm going to have laying queens up and running within a few days rather than a month or so. And then there's that nervous wait to see if any queens that I've raised have been mated well, or if they're the dreaded drone-laying queens that I experienced last year. On that note, it's interesting to see that so far this season, and touch wood, 
every virgin queen that's been out to mate has arrived back successfully to her hive and appears to be well mated and laying normally. Last year was a bit of a mess early season with drone laying queens and the general chatter seems to be that there was or is something going on with the ability of the drones to mate or that they're not as healthy as they once were. This year so far seems to be a lot different. Anyway, back to the introduction of those queens. I like to use hopelessly queenless nukes, as I seem to have the most success with these. As I said, they don't have to be large nucleus colonies, and you could get away with a single frame if you were stuck and needed something urgently. I popped over to the alpaca apiary and used the honeypaw langstroths for my nukes. The poly nukes from honeypaw take four frames, which are ideal, as they have a nice capacity for brood and bees enough to overwinter, and with four frames only, they don't drain resources quite so fast, and you can give the colony a frame or two of foundation to work on and keep them busy. So I made up mostly two-frame nukes and gave two frames of foundation. Oh, by the way, the plastic frames that I've been trying out, so far, disaster. The bees are not pulling out the comb evenly, and I've obviously cocked it up somehow. I need to go back to the drawing board with them, but I'll talk a bit more about those another day. So making up these nukes is dead easy. Firstly, open up the hive or hives that you're going to take frames from. We're simply robbing frames from hives here. That's all it takes to make up a nuke. The process for me is just like a normal inspection, working my way through the hive removing a frame of food to start with. Those outside frames are normally stuffed full of food. The important thing here is to find the queen. We don't really want to be transferring the queen into a nuke, although it's not a major problem because if that happens, we'll soon find out by seeing eggs in the nuke rather than in the hive, and we can requeen the hive rather than the nuke. So I have all of the nukes spread out on the grass, ready to accept frames as I wander around filling them. The trick here is to balance what you're putting into each nuke. Remember the old mantra of resources, enough bees and enough stores for each nuke. We don't want a nuke box full of sealed stores and few bees wandering around the frames, while other boxes are full of brood and bees but starve because they have no food. So a frame of food goes into the nuke and then back to the hive to check for the next frame. This time, it's another frame of food, so that goes into another nuke box. The next frame is full of sealed brood, so that can go into one of the nukes that already has a frame of food in it. This process continues until you've exhausted all of the available frames, and each nuke box is reasonably balanced with bees, brood, and food. I ended up with either two or three frames in each box and had intended to make up ten nuke boxes in total, but only had enough frames for eight. Those blasted plastic frames had let me down. But here's the important point. Don't spread them out too thinly if you can help it. Give each nuke enough bees, brood and food to give the new queen a good start, with space to lay, but enough bees to tend to the eggs and brood that she lays. This way, you'll get a reasonable build-up of brood and then bees to follow. It's going to be at least a month before her first workers emerge, and for me, that's going to be the end of June now. These queens are going to head up colonies going into the winter ready for next spring. I'm hoping my planning will be rewarded with a strong crop of honey next spring and summer. These nukes, once sorted, are then closed up by adding the roof and blocking the entrance, loaded onto the truck and taken away to the fishing lake's 14 by 12 apiary, ready to have the queens added. I'd allowed four days between making up the nukes and the anticipated arrival of the queens. Plenty of time for them to try to make emergency queen cells, and that's really important. Fast forward to the arrival day of the queens, and all is set. The queens arrived on time, and a quick check that they were all okay confirmed 20 neatly packaged queens with attendant workers, each queen resplendent with a bright blue dot on her thorax. The important thing here is not to leave the box in the truck in full sun. We really don't want to dehydrate and kill our precious new arrivals. 
Off to the apiary as soon as we can. The queens were only packaged up the day before, so they haven't been hanging around for any length of time. If they had been, it would be advisable to give them a little water to drink, but it was less than 24 hours since they'd been picked and packed, so to speak. One of the most important tasks prior to introducing the new queens is to check all of the nukes for queen cells. It's now been four full days since the nukes were made up, and removing all of the queen cells now will ensure that the nukes are hopelessly queenless, meaning they have no way of making replacement queen cells once these are gone. It's an important but time-consuming task and took me a little longer to complete than I'd anticipated. However, once done, it means we can introduce our queens with a better chance of acceptance. Remember earlier I was talking about ending up with a queen in one of the nukes instead of leaving her in her original hive? Well, that's exactly what I did. One of the nukes was full of eggs, and on closer inspection, I found the queen. Imagine if I hadn't checked and just popped a new queen in there. She'd have been killed instantly, and I would have cursed at myself for such an expensive mistake. That said, I may have inadvertently made an expensive mistake, but more of that in a moment. The queens have an even better chance of acceptance if you remove the attendant workers from the cage prior to insertion into the nukes, and this can be a tricky operation unless you're prepared. On the queen cages I'd received the queens in, there's a little tag that you open to allow the workers out but keep the queen inside. Unfortunately, the workers hadn't read the instructions, and despite leaving them for a while, they mostly just stayed in the cage. Time to switch to plan B. I grabbed a handful of caged queens and jumped back into the truck. Be suit on and hood up, one by one, I carefully opened each cage to allow the workers to fly out. Of course, the queen is the first one out, and this is where, again, you curse yourself for leaving the truck window open. Only kidding, I hadn't left the window open, and a good job too, because the queens all took flight and ended up on the side window of the truck, making it easy to pop the cage over them and slide the cover back in place. You could also use a large plastic bag to trap the queen and re-cage her, if you wanted to do it sat at a table, perhaps. Having finally completed this process for each of the queen cages, it's then an easy enough job to push a matchstick through the eye at the top of the cage, pop open the tag that encloses the fondant and is also the escape route for the queen once the workers and the nukes chew their way through the sweet barrier. It took a while to complete, but once done, we had an apiary that previously had three colonies in it to now having around 15 colonies of different types. I'll move quite a number of these out over the coming weeks to new apiary sites. I kept a couple of queens back to take over to the alpaca apiary. Confession time, fast approaching. The colony that I'd lost its queen to, to one of the nuke boxes, was checked and queen cells removed before the process of releasing workers and the queen cage insertion was carried out. But I still had two queens in cages to place. I made up a couple of additional nukes from the strongest colony in the apiary and used these for the last two queens, jumped into the truck and headed home. Then it dawned on me. I'd made up those last two nukes and put the queens straight in with just the fondant plug to protect them. These nukes would still have their parent queen pheromone on the frames and there's a real possibility I may go back to find the queens released and killed. From previous experience, you really need to leave a nuke queenless for at least a couple of hours to prevent a massacre. All I can say is I'll check up on them and report back next week if I remember. Who knows, they may well be friendly and give the new queen a chance. Then again, probably not. Oh well, just another mistake to put down to experience, and that's an important point for all beginner beekeepers out there to note. No matter how brilliant or experienced a beekeeper you may be, or think you are, things can always go sideways, either by beekeeper error or just because that's how beekeeping is. The best thing to do is to make a mental note, shrug your shoulders, remember the situation for next time, and move on. Two final notes for you before I head off inspecting my bees. Honey extraction has had to be put on hold because of my bad back, which has me stiff and sore again. This time it happened while I was picking salad leaves at the allotment of all the stupid things to be doing. 
This after a full day of moving those nukes around with no ill effects. I have been offered help from Stefan P, but it does mean the oilseed rape isn't coming off until next week, and so I fear it will be fairly well granulated in the cone. It will mean less of an extraction and more of a cutout, and thank goodness for the appy melter, but it will still mean boiling frames, re-waxing, and the loss of drawn cone for the summer honey crop. It does mean, though, that older wax will be replaced and rendered dung, so any pests and diseases harbouring in the supers will be removed, so it's not all bad. It will also mean fresh drawn cone for early next season, where we will once again be on the oilseed rape, I have no doubt. And finally, a short while ago I supplied a nucleus colony to a new beekeeper, Gemma. Hi Gemma, and I'm sure she won't mind me telling you her story. But she was super excited to have her first bees, and settled them into their new home and began her journey in beekeeping. This was really just a few days ago. Then, a couple of days ago, I got a flurry of excited messages saying that she'd watched a swarm fly over her head and settle on a branch within easy reach. Having watched my videos, Gemma was confident enough to have a go at collecting them, literally days after starting her new beekeeping career. To cut a long story short, the bees went into a nuke box and promptly absconded. I'm guessing they were too large a swarm to feel comfortable in the nuke, but such was the luck of our intrepid new beekeeper that the swarm went straight back to the same branch they had previously settled on. Having offered up further advice to Gemma, I'm delighted to say the second collection and housing of the swarm has been super successful, and there are now two hives with bees sat at the bottom of her garden. Congratulations, Gemma. It's fantastic that you've done so much in such a short space of time. I'm certain they'll give you an enormous amount of pleasure. Oh, and pain. Just wait for that first sting. It's bound to happen. Before I go, a quick hello to Backdoor Bread on Instagram, who left a lovely comment and who has only just started beekeeping in the past few days. It always delights me to know that I can help out beekeepers even when they're on the other side of the planet. In this instance, Vermont, USA. Well, that's it for this week. Have a great beekeeping week. Stay safe and please do remember to check out my Patreon page where you can access lots more content. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. I'm Stuart Spinks and that was beekeeping short and sweet. Mm -hmm.